Everything in South China comes second to rice. Mao Ping has just enough acres of paddy to feed its own population. They grow two crops of rice and one of winter wheat in these fields. It's early October and the second of the year's rice harvests will soon be underway. They're starting to cut some fields already. In the days of Mao Zedong, agriculture was collective. The harvest belonged to everyone and there was little incentive for the individual. But in 1981, all that changed. Now, each family takes responsibility for what it produces. Mrs. Hu's family has been allocated half an acre of paddy to plant and tend and harvest. Rice needs constant and careful irrigation. They pay a small fixed tax, but all the rice they grow is their own. The harder they work, the more they'll have. It'll be another week or two before their rice is ready to cut. The villagers eat a staggering amount of rice. Anything up to two pounds of it each day. That's three or four times their own body weight in uncooked rice each year. If rice is one symbol of southern China, bamboo is another. Painters are inspired by its elegance. Poets say it grows as straight as an upright man. For the villagers of Mao Ping, it means money. This week, Li Sen, Mrs. Hu's middle son, with other members of the number eight production team, is cutting bamboo. Last week he was felling timber. The villagers have been cutting bamboo for centuries. Now it's all part of a government economic plan. Mao Ping has to sell a minimum quota to the state each year. But just as there's now an incentive to grow more rice, Li Sen will be paid for the amount of bamboo he cuts. If he works hard, it can be quite lucrative. The Chinese value bamboo for its versatility. It is strong and light and supple. It's used for furniture, matting, baskets, prams, shoulder poles, cooking utensils. There's no end to the variety of uses they find for it. And it's needed all over the country. It's harder work than it looks. Each of them is carrying more than 50 kilos, almost their own weight in bamboo. And it's nearly three miles back to the village and the midday meal.
Meal times are when the Hu family comes together. Lunch is the main meal of the day. Food supply has always been precarious in China, at the mercy of flood or drought or government policy. And a century of upheaval has reinforced their folk memories of starvation. So mealtime for peasant families is almost a religious ritual. It encapsulates the three most important things in their lives, the home, the family, and food. <coughs> They're building a small power station high up above the river near Maoping. Mr. Hu was an engineer in the army, and he's been asked to supervise the workmen. He doesn't earn any more than he would in the forest, but the job gives him status, and that's almost more important than money. <laughs> <laughs> Most afternoons, Mrs. Hu and the other women in her family sit and talk in the courtyard. The party insists that men and women are equal in the new China. But that doesn't mean that they abandon their traditional roles. For the next generation, things may be very different. The new one-child policy will bring great change to family life. But so far, the pattern of life for the women of Mao Ping, at least on the surface, has not changed all that much. <laughs> But Mrs. Hu is not complaining. There's an air of confidence and strength about these women. They know that family life revolves around them. They usually control the purse strings. They have authority within the household. It's said that if a husband is the outside master, 
Back home, his wife is the inside master. If you're unwell in Maoping, there's a clinic you can go to. It's part of what used to be an old temple. Mrs. Hu's sister-in-law believes her vital force is out of balance and wants a checkup. The young rural doctor is one of several from the commune hospital who take it in turns to spend a month in Maoping. He had 18 months medical training when he left school. He relies on a mixture of traditional and Western methods of treatment. Medical care is not free in the countryside. She pays a small fee for the consultation and half the actual cost of the drugs. Were she to need an operation, she'd have to pay half the cost of that. It could amount to a year or two's earnings and be financially crippling to the family. They'll be needing baskets and drying mats as the rice harvest gets into full swing. A family of traveling basket makers has arrived. It's a traditional skill they still hand down to their children. Since the government now encourages private initiative, craftsmen like these are becoming increasingly mobile. Their work is usually of a much higher quality than what's available in the shops, and their prices are competitive. They're welcomed by the villagers. For most people, making a living is still very hard work. Half their lives are spent carrying heavy loads. They say it's their shoulders that earn them their keep. The work they do and when they do it is dictated by the seasons, by the weather, by the hours of daylight. It's a relentless, age-old cycle. Life for the villagers may sometimes look idyllic on the surface, but it's also a treadmill. If they get the chance to find other work, they'll often take it. This small factory, started by the villagers themselves, produces Bakelite mouldings. Mrs. Wang is the manager of the factory. She's also the deputy party secretary. She chooses the lucky girls who work here. 
She takes into account their family circumstances, their ability to be punctual, and above all, what she calls their good ideology. It's not easy, she says, to teach peasants to become factory workers. Uh As greater prosperity comes to the countryside and better education, the authorities face a potential problem. China's economy relies on the peasants to feed the nation. But won't this generation have different ambitions? At school, the children are taught to respect manual labor. It's one of the basic aims of what they call moral education. <laughs> Chin 清子教堂他讲你烧垃圾搞卫生是人民的勤务员我们当主席也是人民的勤务员这是革命的分工不同在社会主义革命当中都是不可缺少所以同学们啊从这里我们可以看出在我们社会主义的国家里劳动和劳动人民是平等的没有高低贵贱之分